A2 further maths, exponential distribution. Okay, so the number of customers are entering the shop, A per hour. And what I want to know is what type of distribution would you use to model this situation? Okay, so just have a think about it. What type of distribution would you use? Okay, so if you were thinking Poisson distribution, you would have been right. Now, if it is going to be Poisson distribution, what sort of assumptions must you make in this situation? So what sort of assumptions must you make for it to fit with Poisson distribution? So the assumptions you should have made is that the customers that actually come into the shop should be independent of each other. So you shouldn't have a situation where you've got just a, a group from a bus coming in all at the same time or anything like that, or couples. You're, you're assuming that each person is independent of any other person coming into the shop. The other thing you need to do is assume that this rate of eight per hour is constant. So it's always eight, eight per hour. You imagine if it's first thing in the morning, it could be very different to if it's uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. So you need to make sure that you've got a constant rate of eight per hour. Okay, so what I'd like you to think about is rather than doing a press on distribution, I want you to think about this. The owner records the time she waits between the customers. Okay, so she's looking at time. Now, as you know, Poisson distribution is a discrete random variable. All right, you can only get, you can only count the number of people that come into your shop. So it's always a discrete value. Whereas what she's doing now is she's actually changing it from a discrete variable into a continuous variable because she's recording the time she waits between her customers. So if a customer comes in the shop, when the customer leaves, she then sets the timer times till the next customer comes in. Now, what I'd like you to do is think about this. We've got the data set up and plotted onto a histogram. Well, it has to be a histogram because it's continuous data. So I'm setting it up as a histogram. Along the bottom, I'm just setting wait time between customers in minutes. And at the side, I'm doing a probability density. And what I'd like you to do is just think about what the sketch of that histogram would look like. Okay, so just have a quick pause in there, sketching the histogram, seeing what you think. Okay, so if you're thinking it's eight per hour, so therefore the majority of customers should come in this sort of five to 10 category, because that would make sense because it's eight per hour. So we expect to have roughly about five, five to 10 minutes. You'd need one every about five to 10 minutes to fit eight per hour. Then you'd probably be out, right? So the wait time in those two regions, we could certainly put in, say, there we go, there's a probability. And some of you might put those as the biggest bars. I wouldn't blame you at all. OK, so you're considering those two as being the most common. Once you get past 10 minutes, though, there might be times where she has to wait longer than 10 minutes. Right. So there's going to be times where you wait a bit longer. Now, these wait times here on this side never actually end. She could actually wait half an hour between a customer. All right. It's not very likely, but it could happen. So as we go along, any of these times are possible, right? Any of these times are possible, but as you go along, they're getting less and less likely. Now, this is where it's important to think about this. If you've got an average of eight per hour, and you've got some times that are up here in the 20 minutes region, you're gonna to have to have quite a few in the lower limit to basically break those two down to keep at this eight per hour. All right, to have 20, if you had one that's at 20 minutes, that's going to pull this rate really high unless you've got quite a few in these two categories here, maybe quite a few in the that take between one and two minutes to come in to counteract just one 20 minute person. So instead of these two being the biggest bar, what you have to find is that these two here will end up being the biggest bars. These two here. OK, so you need lots of times in here to counteract some of the really big times. You imagine waiting half an hour. That's going to throw this right out unless you have lots of times in the naught to five minute category. Right. If you change that into a graph and kept reducing the bars, what you end up with is this exponential type graph. So as those bars get smaller and smaller, because you've got some times over here, you need more times over in this small category. And we end up with this exponential distribution, this exponential curve. 
Right, so what I'd like to do is grab your notebooks. So exponential distribution, as you know, with it, we just discussed with it being at a time, therefore it's a continuous random variable. And what it looks at is the intervals between different Poisson distributions. So that situation we just talked about, people coming into a shop, was definitely a Poisson distribution, or could be modelled as a Poisson distribution. But because we're looking at the time interval between the Poisson distributions, it turns into an exponential distribution. You can use an exponential distribution to model that. Because we use a, a lambda value for the, for the unit between Poisson, so we usually do that over a time limit or something like that for Poisson. How many people come into the shop in three hours? You would count the number of people into the shop. OK, so we use a lambda value to represent that, that interval. You use exactly the same interval for exponential distribution. Right? So exponential distribution uses exactly the same value as it would do for Poisson. Right? They're identical. All right, so in that previous one, I could I'll you have the same lambda value for the number of people coming into the shop as the lambda value for the time interval that people come into the shop. We can write it in this sort of distribution. All right, so we write in, as you've seen this before, you've seen it for normal distribution now for binomial distribution. EXP means an exponential distribution. So X is distributed with an exponential distribution with a parameter lambda that is the rate that people are coming into the shop in this example then what you can do is you can write the continuous random variable as a distribution like this so as a function distribution or as a probability function we know or i'm telling you now that you could write it as lambda e to the minus lambda x where x is greater than or equal to zero because it's a time you can always start at zero OK, people won't come into the shop with a negative time. So you start in that time at zero. Once you get to that, zero everywhere else. Remember, for a probability function like this, you must define all points. So anything greater than or equal to zero is this. Notice it never ends. It just tends towards zero. Anything negative isn't going to happen. So that has a probability of definitely zero. OK, so while you're sticking with your notebooks, what I'd like you to do, please, is just Get this question down. So the number of customers that enter a shop is 14 every two hours. As the customers enter the shop, find the probability that the owner waits longer than 10 minutes before the next customer comes in. So if you just get a chance to write that down in your notebooks, pause there if you need more time, and we'll have a look through how to do this question. Okay. So what we need to do first of all is we need to make sure that we take the assumption that it's a Poisson distribution. So the number of people coming into the shop is independent of each other or the people coming into the shop is independent and that it's at a constant rate at any given time. OK, so if I'm doing it over these four hours, it must be constant rate over those four hours. OK, we need to make sure that we've got the lambda value. OK, so the lambda value. So the lambda value is going to be relating to this 14 every two hours. But what I need to make sure is that I'm considering what is the unit of time that I'm measuring. Now, you could actually do it in minutes. Right? There's nothing wrong with you saying, right, 14 every two hours. What's the rate every minute? And you could change it to minutes or you could change this into hours and have your rate in hours. Now, I'm going for that. I'm changing the rate to seven per hour. So I must consider what this was as a rate. Well, 14 every two hours is the same as seven per hour. I also need to consider what this 10 minutes is in a minute. I need everything to be in the same unit of time for it to work. So the rate is seven per hour. So I've got my lambda value of seven. That would work if I had a, prob a Poisson distribution question or an exponential distribution question, and they can tie these things together. Once I've got my lambda value, as I just said, it's got to be over a set unit of time, okay, per hour. It's no good doing per three hours or anything like that. So I've got my probability notation. I know what it is. It's lambda e to the minus lambda x. So I've put it into that function just there. That's what it's going to be when x is greater than zero. Right, and now I can consider what the question's asking. What's the probability that it only waits longer than 10 minutes? So what's the probability that it's going to wait longer than 10 minutes? Now, the first thing I need to do is not put 10 in, because that would represent 10 hours. 10 minutes is equal to one sixth hours. Okay. 
got 10 over 60. So I've got that first bit sorted. Now I need to think about what probability is. So the probability is going to be greater than or equal to one sixth. Now, if it's greater than or equal to one sixth, the problem with that is it's going to be all the values to infinity. OK, it's going to be this from one sixth up to infinity for that function. Now, the problem with that, of course, is we can't really define infinity. So what we have to do, what we can do is we can look at it the other way. We know that the probability distribution between the very smallest value to the very maximum value is always going to equal to one. So instead of doing greater than, what I can do is I can split it up. I can do minus infinity up to a sixth plus a sixth up to infinity definitely equals one. Now, if I know that and I want this, what I can do is one take away the less than. And you've seen that technique coming up a lot now. But that's what you can do. We can change it around. We can change it to a, a less than as long as we do one minus. Now, the reason why we want to do one minus is because we definitely have a starting point for minus infinity. Poiss um, not Poisson, excuse me, exponential distribution always starts at zero. So we can always set that one to zero. We can fill in this f of x now, which is 7e to the minus 7x, and we get down to this situation. Now, do not forget that you have your calculators. The examiner knows you've got calculators. They will expect you to use them. So you can grab your calculator at this point and just type that in. It will save you having to do it all. OK, so if you type that in one minus whatever your calculator says, OK, you can do it manually, but you don't have to do it on your calculator. Once you've done that, out comes the probability. The probability that shop owner has to wait 10 minutes for the next customer is about 0 0.311. OK, just over 30 percent chance. Okay, so just pause there, make sure you got down what you need. Okay, so we know that the probability the shop owner has to wait 10 minutes before the next customer is about 0 0.311. Okay, that's how long, about a third of an hour. Once you know that, the question I'm going to ask you now is, if the owner has to already waited 10 minutes and nobody's coming to the shop, what's the probability that, that owner will have to wait another 10 minutes? OK, I wouldn't blame you for thinking, well, they've already waited 10 minutes, so chances are it's going to be improved. All right. It's more likely someone's going to come in within the next 10 minutes because they've already had to wait 10 minutes. OK, that seems to fit logically, but it's not actually true. OK, exponential distribution has no memory. It doesn't know how long you've waited. You could have been waiting one minute. You could have been waiting 10 minutes. You could have been waiting three hours. It doesn't know that at all. So when you ask this question, what's the probability I'm going to have to wait 10 minutes? It doesn't matter that you've already waited 10 minutes. It's still going to be 0 0.311. And we say that exponential distribution has no memory. Okay, that's an important fact, and it's worth just making a note of that in your notebooks. It's very common that you get asked this question at the end of an exponential. What's the probability the shop owner has to wait another 10 minutes? Exactly the same answer because exponential distribution has no memory of what's gone before it. OK, pause there if you need more time. OK, so what I'd like you to do now is knowing this probability distribution f of x, write it down in your notebooks for me, please, and then just write down cumulative distribution function and then just roughly in your notes or roughly on a piece of paper, have a go at working out the cumulative distribution function. See if you remember how to do that from that PDF. How do you work out the CDF? OK, so it's no different. Just because you do an exponential distribution, it is still a probability density function. It's still a lowercase f and I still expect you to work out a capital F. And to work out the capital F, you are doing this technique. You are looking at the integral up to some general number x. OK, now to do that, I'm changing it to some variable I'm calling it t doesn't really matter what you use and I'm going to work out what the answer is in terms of x so I integrate it and I get this because it's minus and I get down to that that's quite nice I can substitute the two values in and I notice that e to the minus zero well that's just going to equal to one and I put the one at the front for neatness 
So I get 1 minus e to the minus lambda x. That is your cumulative distribution function. And it sort of makes sense. Probably it is 1 and you are taking away this value continuously. So we could write it like that. Remembering that you've got to cover every single part of it. But notice for this one, because this never ends, because this is a continuous function, it just never ever ends, it just approaches zero, then you don't have this extra part at the end, which is unusual. It's the first time you've seen it. So you don't have a part at the end. So zero when it's x is less than naught makes sense. Anything below zero is definitely going to be zero. But once you hit zero part, it starts off at one and then progressively gets lower and lower and lower. Okay. So just take down what you need. OK, so what I'd like you to do now is see if you can work out the mean of that PDF. So again, you've got a PDF there in there. All right, it's a continuous function. Can you work out the mean? So you can feel free to check back in your notes, see if you remember how to work out the mean of a PDF. OK. So if you remember how to do it, OK, so we know that if we want to work out the expected value of a continuous random variable like this, then we can use this type of function. The expected value is going to be from minus infinity to infinity of x times the function x dx. But we need to be careful because if we actually look at this, when we put x into there, it's going to be an indefinite integral. Right, because we, it carries on to infinity. The ones we've dealt with before, the continuous random variables, usually had an endpoint. They did not just go up to infinity. So once we put this in, we need to make sure that we change that infinity to the p value. And then what we'll do is we'll investigate what happens as p tends towards infinity. So we must solve it as an indefinite integral. I have to be very wary of that. Right, if I want to find the integral of this then, I am going to use integration by parts. So you might want to look at how to do that yourself. You might want to pause there and just have a go. Okay, so if you use integration by parts, it's this formula in your, from your formula book. We can set up the u equaling x. We can differentiate that to get 1. We can set up the part we integrate in, which is the lambda e to the minus lambda x. And that's going to go to something nice like minus e to the minus lambda x. So those two parts are sorted out there. We can substitute those in and we get it down to this. Now before we investigate what happens to p, let's just finish off this bit of integration first. Now that the x has disappeared, we can just integrate this um, as normal and we can see we're going to get this sort of answer here. Now at this stage, I can just work out the full integral and that's it sorted. Noticing that when e to the minus lambda x, x goes to zero, that's going to be zero, so therefore the whole thing's zero, um, which is slightly different on this one. But now what we need to do is we need to look at what happens as p tends towards infinity. Now this bit will be fine. e to the minus uh, lambda infinity clearly tends towards zero, so this bit's going to cancel out. But this is the interesting one. The limit of this as p tends towards infinity, because that's going to get really big, and that is going to get really small. So what happens to this function as p tends towards infinity? Now we've actually just investigated this recently. We did the bit of maths when we did Maclaurin series and we looked at it. And what we found out is that any function of this type like this always goes towards zero. As p tends towards infinity, this function will then go towards zero. It doesn't matter what that power is there, this part here will overpower it and make it go towards zero. So I can use that fact. This is going to be zero. Also, this part here is going to equal zero for the same reason. So therefore, what I'm left with is just minus minus plus one over lambda. So the expected value of an exponential distribution function ends up being just one over that parameter lambda. OK, right, pause there, take what you need to do. OK, what I want you to do is have a go at working out the variance in the standard deviation. So again, pause it, have a go yourself. OK, so hopefully you remembered the formula for 
continuous random variable. And if you're looking for the variance, we're using this formula just here. So it's the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x all squared. So that's the same formula you've seen plenty of times now for the variance. Now this part's not too bad because we've already calculated the expected x and so we can just square it. That's going to be 1 over lambda squared. This part though, how do we work out the expected value of x squared? Well, when we did the expected value of x, we used the integration of x f of x. For x squared, same idea. Just be wary that because we're looking at the integral and x is not defined at infinity, therefore it's an improper integral, we're setting the p parameter there and we'll look at what happens as it tends towards that p value. Right, so I'm just looking at e of x squared for a moment. I'll come back to this bit later on. So I'm solving this. Notice that I can do it exactly the same way as before. So I'm integrating by parts. The x squared is what I want to be differentiating. So x squared is going to go to 2x. That part will then be integrated and go to v equals minus e to the minus lambda x. So when I substitute it in, what I'm going to find is that it doesn't actually cancel down perfectly. I'm going to have to do it twice. This part though, I can work out, and that's just going to go to minus p squared. Duh, 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 duh. Don't forget the zero is going to cancel the whole thing. This bit is what we just discussed about limits. As p tends towards infinity, then p squared might tend towards infinity, but this bit is going to tend towards zero at a quicker rate. So the whole thing will go to zero. Okay, we'll use that fact in a minute. This part though, we can integrate again. So yes, x, 1, this bit's going to be e of x, so therefore you go back to this. So we can integrate using by parts again. We can use that fact to cancel this down. So that's just going to go to 0, minus 2 lots of those two bits, so that's there, and minus 2 lots of minus this part. So that's where the plus 2, I could drag out the lambda, make it a little bit easier for myself, leaving me e to the minus lambda x. OK, this part, I can use this result again. So this is going to go to this part. This is going to tend towards zero as P tends towards infinity. OK, so I can know that's going to go towards zero. This part I can definitely work out and solve that. So therefore I get to this answer. Right? This is the result of this one between zero and P. So what do I get? Well, I get this result like this. And then what I notice is that this result is going to go towards 2 over lambda. This part's going to disappear towards 0. This part will be plus 1 over lambda times 2 over lambda. So I get 2 over lambda squared. Right, so that is that part just there sorted out. I haven't taken away this bit yet, and that's what I'm going to do now. OK, so e of x squared, I know, is 2 over lambda squared. Right, let's keep on with that for a minute. Let's go back to this formula. So we've got 2 over lambda squared, which is the result I just said, minus 1 over lambda, all squared, because that was e to the x. So what do you end up with? Final result, 1 over lambda squared. Now remember, you wanted both the um, variance and the standard deviation. So the variance is 1 over lambda squared. And the standard deviation is going to be the square root of that. So the square root of 1 over lambda squared is going to be 1 over lambda. Remembering that lambda is going to be a positive value. So 1 over lambda is going to be a positive value. OK, so we've got that probability distribution just in your notebooks. I know you've copied down those previous notes, but it's worth just having these pair together to make sure they're nicely highlighted so you're aware of them. So the mean of a probability distribution function f of x is always going to be e of x is 1 over lambda. And the variance is always going to be 1 over lambda squared. Now, if you remember for Poisson, the, ex the expected value for Poisson was just lambda and the variance was just lambda as well. OK, so they're closely related to the previous ones. Just be wary, they're not quite the same, though, because for Poisson, it was expected and variance the same. Whereas for exponential, it's the expected and the standard deviation that are the same. They're both 1 over lambda. OK, right. Pause there. Make sure you've got down what you need in your notebooks. OK, so sticking with your notebooks for a minute. 
What I want to do is just grab this exam question down. There's Philly, he's waiting to catch a train. He's waiting, he's got the a lambda value of 0 0.31. Um, we want to find the mean and standard deviation. We just had a formula for those, so that shouldn't be too bad. We can use our formula books to find those formulas. Find the probability Phil will wait for less than six minutes. All right, so we need to find a probability there. And Phil has already been waiting for a train for five minutes. Find the probability Phil will have to wait a further four minutes more for the trains. Okay, we've got another probability question to go as well. All right, so pause there, get the question down, maybe have a go yourselves. And then we'll have a look at the answers, the model solutions. OK, so let's have a look at part A first of all. So we've got a formula for this. And we know that the expected value is going to be 1 over lambda. We just saw that. So therefore, the expected value in this case is 1 over 0 0.31, which is 3.23. We also know, as we just saw, that for expected distribution, the mean and the standard deviation are exactly the same things. So if I know that the mean is 3.23, the standard deviation is also 3.23. The mean and the standard deviation are the same. The mean and the variance are different, so you need to be careful. All right, so that's part A done. Just making sure we pick out the correct formulas and make use of them. Okay, let's look at part B. So in part B, now we need to solve a probability distribution. Now, what we can do is we can use the continuous distribution function. We can use a CDF. All right, if we can formulate the CDF, now we know the formula for the CDF. It was 1 minus e to the minus lambda x. So we've got the formula for the CDF. Now, what the CDF does is it works out the cumulative distribution function, everything up to this value of x, whatever x value I want. In this case, it's going to be 6. So I can substitute that into there. Okay, so I've substituted it in. And then once I've got that, I can just calculate this answer. And the probability I wait less than 6 minutes is 0 0.84. It's a very good chance when you consider you're not waiting that long for a train. It's a very good chance you'll, you'll get one within less than 6 minutes. Okay, let's look at the next question. So Phil has already been waiting for a train for 5 minutes. Find the probability Phil will be waiting for more minutes. So it's quite easy for you to start thinking in part C, it's start easy for you to start thinking, I'm going to look at nine minutes. Right? But don't forget, it doesn't make any difference at all that Phil's been waiting for five minutes. Exponential distribution has no memory of that at all. Right? It could have been waiting 25 minutes, it could have been waiting one minute. It makes no difference. So you can ignore that bit of information completely. Right? It doesn't matter about that. All you're doing is finding the probability that Phil will wait more than four minutes for his train. So we're really looking what's the probability it's greater than this value x is 1 minus the CDF of x. Noticing that you can't do greater than because it goes up to infinity, but you can do less than. So it's 1 minus that. That is 1 minus that. That's the formula for it. Okay. That's going to do everything up to 4. So 1 minus is going to do everything greater than 4. And then we can work out that by using that formula. What happens then? We can stick our values in. Notice this cancels down. It's good, good. 1 minus 1 minus minus that gives you this answer straight away. So therefore, I can substitute in. I want number 4. So 4 is my x value. Lambda is a 0 0.31. Substitute it in. Probability I'll wait 4 or more minutes is about. 0.289. Okay, so roughly about 30% chance. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is have a go at some of these exponential distribution questions yourself on that exercise.